Yeah, the, the newest one, I think. <laughs> did we the last you one. Huh? Did we introduce you? No, yeah, yeah, Max already did something like a few months ago, so no problem. <laughs> 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 yeah, more or less the same. Uh, you are not killing people, but more or less it's, it's the same. Okay, first of all, thank you for being here after lunch. I will try not to, I mean, to keep you awake, at least. From time to time I can shout something, just see, see that you are sleeping. And the idea is, this is, uh, this is a talk I gave a few months ago in a, in a conference. They invited me, so with the audience we thought that it could be also interesting for, as a seminar. And this is not something that, I mean, it's not, let's say, my main research line. It's more a uh, curiosity that we had with some friends of the PhD. And so we worked something like in our spare time. Uh, something happened, so let's see, if you, let's see if you like it. The idea of this work is just to trying to quantify if there is nepotism in academia in different countries, and also what could be the effects, let's say. But let me start with the definition of nepotism. This is taken strictly from Wikipedia. And it's more or less the practice among those with power of favoring relatives, friends, especially by giving them jobs. This is the, this is the, basic, uh, this is the basic idea. Um, interesting thing is that actually the word came from Italian. <laughs> uh, actually, I'm going to see a lot of Italians during this talk. <laughs> so this is something that I can spoil you. And actually it came from the fact that probably some nephews of popes and other members of the clergy that maybe were something like illegitimate sons or something similar got also positions, high ranked position inside the, inside the church and other places. So obviously then from the Italian we passed to French and then from French from English because we know that the British are good people so usually they don't use these kind of things. And, but he, historically, nepotism has always been there, but wasn't a problem, let's say. Or at least it's not bad per se. Let's start with an example. Don't worry, I mean, this is just the first one. It, it will be really fast. I've not spent the entire history of, <laughs> of this thing. So probably you know this guy. is Julius Caesar. And actually, when he was assassinated, his son, this guy here, Julius Caesar Octavianus, got the, let's say, the wealth, inherited all the, the 70% of all the wealth of, of Caesar, but also the, le, let's say, his army. So the Caesar armies were faithful to, to him. And this, this plays an important role in uh, the civil war that started after the assassination, the assassination of Caesar, because at the end he won the war, he got elected, let's say, the first emperor of, of the Roman Empire, and also he was probably one of the best emperors so the people give him the, the name of Augustus, that means something like above the others, something. Very important, very important guy. But there is a trick. It actually wasn't Julius Caesar's son. It was something like the son of one of his sisters, but they were part of the same uh, um, large family, the Gaius family, the gens in, uh, in Latin. And what happened is that what they used in the Roman Empire was just to each a noble family selects something like the best, the most promising young, young guy in the family, and they put it at the end of the at the end of the family once the old guy dies. So actually, what happens is that uh, Julius Caesar adopted Octavianus before he died, and this helped him during the let's say the conquest of the power, all this thing. Uh, so it was somehow it was a good thing. They select the best between them just to prosper for prosperity of the family. What's happening is that in the, right now things change a little bit, but we are not <laughs> trying to judge anyone here. Our, our idea is, is there nepotism in academia? Is it important? It, it plays a role, for example, in hiring or other, or other things. And the problem is that it's, really, it's a really hard problem, mainly for lack of data, because obviously 
If you go to sleep, so some guy, usually you don't put it public. That's the main problem. And the problem is that uh, evidence till now is have been somehow anecdotal. There are some cases known, for example, this is from the beginning of last year. In South Korea, it seems that some professors signed their papers with their kids. It ended up, so it seems that in Korea, the, um, the university system is really competitive. So if you end high school with already one or two papers published, your chances of getting, uh, of getting a position are way higher than you expect. I don't know. This ended up also in, uh, this ended up also in nature, in science, in the news. And it seems that of more than 82 papers, something like 39, where it seems that there was something there. Some of them were just part of an exchange program for high school students. But in some cases, others were really, really young. So this thing doesn't hold too much. But this was just an anecdote, nothing there. So another thing is that don't laugh. You don't need to go that far, go to the physics department. <laughs> Here we are. No, no, the physics OK, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, don't, I, didn't know, I didn't know if somebody's going to be there. So <laughs> so I was going to be here. So I said, OK, let's go. Let's go to Madrid. There is something that is <laughs> it's not so close. And this is, for example, what he says that the deans and nine officials of the university all have family working there. So even in, say, even in Spain, we have these kind of problems. Actually, during lunch, we were discussing. It seems there are many cases. But I will show you that Spain, it's not that, it's not that bad. But let's go to my favorite, obviously Italians. <laughs> This is, this, is one of my, this is one of my best. This is BBC News, so something that should be a trusted source, let's say. And this is the largest university in Italy, La Sapienza University in Rome. And it's probably the largest presential university in Europe. We're talking about 200,000 students or something like this. And this is the king. Well, the king, the provost, sorry. <laughs> but you can see how, he's, how he was dressed. And I think, uh, actually, this is Luigi Frati, who was dean of medicine for many, many years, then acted as the provost of the entire university, and actually his regency has been marked with many scandals. This is still uh, BBC News. I'm not inventing anything in this, this point, so please, uh, let's say the lawyers of Luigi Frati are not involved in this. This is the, the thing. And actually, what happens is that um, among all the scandals, there are some that are quite interesting, for example, it seems that you saw the promotion of his wife, a former local high school history teacher, to the post of professor of medical history. Another thing, his daughter, they also got a professor of legal medicine without any specific medical education. <laughs> and it seems that also his son, at least he, has a, he is a doctor, so it's good, but he was appointed professor in, cardi professor in cardiology at 31, something that in Italy is so like by far the youngest professor in Italy, so like 10 years before any other, anyone else. So, okay, these are more or less our facts, but anecdotes. I mean, we don't have a complete study about, about all these things. So the question is, is there nepotism in academia? Uh, can we measure it? As I told you, it's um, really, I mean, it's a, it's a complex problem because what happens is there are so many issues, for example, it's really hard, even giving the, uh, the definition of nepotism, it's not clear. So for example, a relative. If we are talking about my, my son, my cousin, okay, but the cousin of my cousin still counts or not. And also there are, very, I mean, there are lots of privacy issues because you cannot know people usually, it's not, doesn't share this kind of, this kind of data with, uh, with the others. So maybe it's the lack, the, the main problem is the lack of is the, the lack of, uh, of data, but there is also um, what we are doing in this, in, let's say, in the literature, something that is at least is the only resource that we have. So the only way that we have trying to measure this thing, even if it has some problems, is using shared last names. So for example, if I'm in a department with another guy with, my same, uh, with the same last name, and we appear together more than you expect at random, probably we, there is something behind it. Obviously, in this case, there are also some, some problems. Uh, one thing you cannot measure is the effect of the so-called social capital. 
Social capital in the sense that, for example, he, let's took uh, Roberto and Damia. They are two very talented uh, scientists. They have a son. <laughs> <laughs> they, they have a son. So he, their son just grew up in this, in this environment. So it's highly probable that, highly probable, probable that we follow their path. So, and the go yeah, also, also it's <laughs> probably it's the same. But you have to account of this kind of effects and this is really, this is really hard. So how do you distinguish between merit and just nepotism? But it's okay. And also another thing that we shared that obviously we need to take care about how you analyze this kind of, uh, how you analyze the fact that we have shared the last names and their frequency. And for, just to give you an example, this is my house in Georgia. She is, uh, let's say, a very rampant uh, politician in, uh, in Italy with, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 I'm joking, I'm joking. I don't know her, she's not my cousin. I don't. Actually, uh, I would like to state here that I have nothing to do with her. <laughs> the point was exactly this one. <laughs> was because otherwise, at this point, I would just dean of the faculty of physics in Rome. So <laughs> that was the thing. No, but this is just explained my point. The fact that uh, we grew up in the same city, she's a little <laughs> bit older even if in her picture she uses a lot of Photoshop, so she seems younger than me. <laughs> but the idea is that fortunately we are not related. <laughs> so the fact that the same surname ap appears twice, just for example in a publication, alone it's not a sign of nepotism. Actually what you need, you need statistical relevance. And actually the entire, the entire literature about this is about mm, way of measuring the statistical relevance, trying to avoid all the biases that you can, that you can have. Okay, so let's leave Kaus in Georgia here. And let's start, let's say, one of the first papers in this very, very small literature is this working paper made by Italians, obviously, in Italy. Uh, actually, the vast majority of the literature just deals with Italians. I don't know <laughs> exactly why, why, but it's okay. And this is a working paper of 2011, but actually uh, as a, is a working paper that's been around for many, many years, so like from 2009, more or less. And what they do, they got uh, 20 years of Italian university professors in uh, 14 disciplines, and also they knew the departments where the professor work. They defined two different measures. One is called the shared last names so the number of last names present in a, the same last name present in a department. And the other one is just the concentration, is just the distribution of these last names. And to have an idea of the distribution of last name that you expect in the population, they compare with the tax income. They actually, probably in Italy it's not so relevant because the <laughs> taxpayers is <laughs> way, way less than you expect, but at least we hope it's a lar larger part of the population. So, you, they have these two indices for the entire population of Italy, and they have the same thing for each department. So they study the time evolution of these two indices in the different, uh, in the different, let's say, in the different periods. And another thing that they used, they also uh, divided the Italian regions by the one with more um, le higher social capital, measured as number of book read in a in a year number of journals, uh, both in a, in a year, and museums, all the other theaters, all the other things. So they basically they divided the regions in Italy from the one with high social capital and low social capital. Unfortunately, what happens is that it also means they split Italy in two. The north are the good guys, the, the one with the high social capital, and the south is like the bad guys. Uh, Rome counts as a south. It's quite clear. So <coughs> these are the curves. The red one is for, let's say, for the high social capital, so the north of Italy, and the one is for the south, and these are the two, the two indices. So you can see, I mean, people from the north, they seem that they are more or less stable. So since they are more or less good guys, actually people from the south, it's not so, it's not so clear. And also there is another important thing, is that this point, this line here, this is the main, the main topic of the paper, is a law that has been passed by the Italian parliament in 2000 that actually deregulated the hiring of professors. So the hiring professors passed from the centralized 
to be given to the universities. <laughs> and here, people in the South just went crazy. They just, okay, <laughs> let's hire them. They are anyone. <laughs> <laughs> are between indexes you are evaluating? Uh, this one is the number of shared last name inside one, uh, one department. Mm -hmm. The other one is the concentration. It's a bit different. Because if you take the number, for example, let's say that you have, uh, the, the, um, uh, you have something like five shared last names. Mm -hmm. You have five couples. But these couples could be, for example, the same guy with just uh, 10 guys with the same surname or just cu uh, five couples of two guys. So this counts the number, this counts the distribution. So even if uh, both of them are in this, in, the, in this index, you have something like 10, in this index you have the, dist the distinction between 10 with the same surname or five couples. This is the, the thing. Okay, Sandra, one question. How do you solve the problem of common surnames? This is why we made a, a paper about that. Because this was just the first one. Actually, uh, my idea, the idea uh, during this talk is just to show you, ah, they did bad, they did bad. Oh, we are the best. That's the, <laughs> that's the main thing. So <laughs> next step is obviously a fight that happened in a few years ago in the literature between, between Italians. That's the thing. This was uh, one of the first papers is after the, the paper that I showed you before has been made by this guy, Stefano Alessina, that is a um, theoretical ecologist. Uh, he is Italian, but he's working in the United States. Probably this is important, the reason why. So he, the guy is not working on these kind of things. He just analyzed some, some data. He published it in PLOS One. And what happened, he also took the Italian university professors, divided them by the, the discipline, let's say, and considered almost all the, univer the public universities in um, in Italy. And the problem is how did he quantify statistical relevance? The guy came from, let's say, statistical physics, so he used a Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo method. What he, da what he did was, you, for each sector you have K researchers and surnames, so he produced a distribution of extracting these N surnames at random and see if the distribution he had in each department was statistically relevant to, to the rest. So it's measuring the scarcity of last names. Because if you have nepotism, probably you have uh, people with the same surname, so you, the number of different surnames that you find there is smaller than you expect at random. And he validated if it was statistically relevant or not. And these are the results. For these disciplines in Italy, we have law, industrial engineering, medical sciences, agriculture, chemistry. It seems that the, la the last names were scarcer than you expect at, uh, at random. And once again, you also found that going south, let's say, increases your probability of finding, uh, finding nepotism. So people in Milan, for example, white means no nepotism, and darker green means high nepotism. Probably they are the good ones. In Rome, you can find almost everything, from very white to very, very green and in the south as you can see you can find for example I think that this university was a private university probably they closed because they have um, many scandals with the rector and I don't know if the rector got arrested I cannot remember exactly but okay so <clears throat> this was the first thing so settled no other two guys also on plus one answered and what they did also Italians but this time they are in uh, they are in Rome in La Sapienza University the answer, what they did was consider the same, uh, the same data set as before, the Italian professors, but also compare with the UK. This is a subset of professors in UK, but you know that British people, they are good. So mm -hmm. if we found uh, something there, it means that actually there is, a, um, there is a problem with the method. The idea was to criticize the method of, of Alessina. And what they did, they also did another interesting thing. This is quite clever. They also analyzed given names of Italian academics. So they repeated the analysis of Alessina for the UK. And then did another analysis for given names. Given names, you expect that they are at random. Because obviously, I mean, you don't pick up, or at least, or you have generations like English lords or something like this, but otherwise, your given name is random. So they analyzed the two data sets in this way, and what we found that also in the UK, there is nepotism. Actually, 
even more than Italy. When I read this paper, I was pretty happy, I said, at least for once. Mm -hmm. But uh, more or less the same thing. There is pharmacy, geography, agriculture, there was law somewhere, chemistry. You can see that these one are, let's say, statistically relevant. But the interesting thing comes from the other one, the given names. I clearly found that also in six disciplines, they found that there was a scarcity of given names. <laughs> Meaning that, okay, no, the method doesn't work. So this was something like the last, uh, the last shot, let's say, the last, the last thing that should have caused the, the quarrel, let's say. But then Alessina asked, answer again. <laughs> Fortunately, this time, they didn't put it on, the, on, uh, on plus one. They just put it on the archive, because otherwise spending months reviewing this thing is start to be boring. And actually criticized the, the analysis in two different ways. The first one is the most interesting, let's say, is he divided the, the given names from the Italian, academy, uh, Italian academics between male and female. And actually, if you make this division, what happens is that the statistical significance disappears. Meaning that what's happened is that in some fields, there are uh, strong gender differences. So for example, uh, female names in Italian, male and female names are quite different. You can tell just reading, I mean, usually end in A or uh, Sandro against Roberta, for example. So what's happened is that he found that in many uh, physics is here, then there is informatics engineering, industrial engineering, geography. So what's happened is that the, the differences could be explained just dividing the two, just dividing the asset in two, male and female names. And so the scarcity of male or female names in some uh, in some areas can explain the the fact that was that was relevant. And also, I found also another interesting thing looking at the UK, for example, some specific field immigration. So you can see the first surname in statistics is a typical British name, Chen. <laughs> the same for Wang in uh, something that is, let's say, I think this the part from Scotland probably there. But this, is, but this is explains more or less why. Because in some fields, for example, in uh, other sciences, there have been a strong immigration from Asia in the last years. So the name distribution changed a long time. So all this was just to explain all the problems that you can find uh, using this kind of data. As I told you, is something like the only uh, resource that we have. So the main issues that we found was, first of all, Surnames are not distributed uh, evenly. They probably they follow a navy tail distribution. Another thing is that there are strong regional differences that can also change in time. And the third thing is also the time evolution. For example, if you repeat the same analysis in the UK in the 70s, probably Brown or Smith will be the most common uh, surname, not the. So the idea, is, it seems that even analyzing one single country, it's really hard. Let's say. So what we did is say, okay, let's try worldwide. So if you're going to fail, let's gonna try to fail worldwide. <laughs> <laughs> that was the, the basic idea. Actually, it went quite well, I have to say. Mm, this was just a couple of friends from the university. As I told you, what we did was uh, we took something like in the entire PubMed. PubMed is the, is the database collecting all the papers published in the health sciences. So medicine, uh, bio, part of biology, part of chemistry, all the, the, all the data sets. And the good thing is that you can, with some time, and a computer scientist, you can download it, more or less. And so we got, for more than 50 years of data, something like 20 million articles, 10 million authors, and the important thing is that the papers with more than one Paper with more than one author, because you need the fact that they appear twice. So if the same guy, probably, it's clear a case of nepotism. It's something like 30 million, 13 million. And uh, obviously, this, this, the papers are not distributed evenly, because what's happened, the United States alone produces something like 40% of the research papers that you can find in the, in the thing. And if you sum uh, the first nine, this should be something like eight or nine uh, countries, you account for more than 70% of the of the data, of the 
entire papers. So for this country, you can have um, reasonable statistics from, let's say, the remaining, the remaining is, we don't have enough data. Another thing that we did was also changing a little bit the definition of uh, nepotism, uh, put it, uh, making it a little bit more stricter. In the sense, the idea is that not only that we are in the same department, but if you appear in the same paper more than once and more than you expect. So for example, uh, my father got a position in, uh, in Rome, I became professor there, I start signing papers with my father. So if I sign one, probably it's okay. Start to sign two, three. The fact that the, the same Meloni appears so many times, respect with respect at random, probably it's, it's a mark of, it's a mark of, uh, let's say, the, um, of the fact that there is nepotism, uh, the nepotism there. Another thing is that also, uh, from, we accept from each author the affiliation, the, the country where he, where he was signing the paper, and to try to avoid all the problems before, we tried three different filtering procedures. I will not enter the day because it's quite boring, and fortunately we have a biostatistician that did the job, because otherwise I wasn't able to do that. And, but the good thing is that at the end, we had that not only we were a mark if there was uh, nepotism or not, but also for each author we know we have a probability of that guy was part of a, of a kin, let's say, what we call families. So very briefly about these filtering procedures that you are trying to avoid these three biases, the major biases that you can, you can find. The first one was quite, let's say, brute force. So about the distribution of surnames. What we did it was, OK, we ordered all the, all the surnames that we have, from the most popular to the last one. So and we deleted the, the, uh, the 15th quartile most, uh, most popular, deleted. The other one was something a little bit, let's say, serious. We, have a, uh, we had a guy just scrapping the Wikipedia web uh, pages for the most common surnames in each country. And for some countries, you also have regions. For example, if you go to Germany, you can see each land of Germany. You, can, you have a page when there are the most common. So try to avoid this thing and also compare with the other one to see if there was something that we missed. The last one, well, let's say the most serious one, then the one that we applied at the end just to refine all the things was also a Monte Carlo method, but this time made on the papers. So for each real paper, we generate five uh, fictional papers, getting data, considering a uh, uh, number of authors, because this is really important, the same country of the original paper, and the same year of the original paper. So we are just redoing the analysis, but this time with something like more than 50 million papers, fictional papers that we created, so from them, we extracted our conditional probability of that two names appears at random in more than one paper. And we calculate, uh, at the end, we mark each author as part of a kin or not. Obviously, these are all proxies. But at least they are more refined than the, the ones that you can find at the beginning. So we are just getting closer. And actually, I, I hope that some of the students here would like to do something better. And OK. Uh, let's keep the technical part. Let's go to the to the results. And these are for this is the time evolution. Here you have the years from the 70s to 2013, and here you have the fraction of um, let's say authors marked as uh, as part of a family with nepotism, and the dashed lines are the worldwide trends. Another, th another important thing is that uh, we have two different analyses, one for all the papers that you have, and one only for the authors, uh, for papers with uh, four or five uh, authors. The reason is pretty simple, is that the number of uh, authors per paper is increasing during the years. For example, after the 80s, with the start of large collaborations, the number just skyrocketed. So what happens is that the overall number of authors, if you co don't consider a constant number of authors, probably you are getting a small bias in the number of in the number of papers. And this was the idea. Let's start with the good guys, let's say. Dutch people. They are really good. I mean almost no nepotism, almost almost zero. Because they are a good society, they behave quite UK also, against what uh, Ferlazzo and Sdoya said, actually it seems they are quite good. Constantly 
Below the average, we are talking about a two, I mean, the worldwide trends, we're talking about three, three, four percent of the authors. In this case, in UK, it's something like less two. Australia also, they are really good for all the years. Let's go to the bad guys. Italy is obviously, obviously is there, but I think that you already imagined it, so the, no surprise. Also Poland, and I don't know if this is starting from the 80s, actually beginning of the 90s, so probably at the end of the, the communist regime was started. Actually, if you also, if you take into account USSR and Russia, uh, people in USSR were doing quite well, uh, at least on this thing. Other things were probably not. <laughs> but I don't know if this is an <laughs> something like an incentive just to go to, to the old regime, but it's okay. And actually what's happening in Russia right now, they are, so another thing that I have to admit that we totally missed India. It's not possible, at that level not possible and probably, but we have an explanation. Uh, society in India is really stratified in different levels. So what happens is that only some levels can access the, the system. And probably even there, there are some specialized families. So it's, it's really hard, so I'm not saying. But as I was saying, Spain actually is not that bad. After the, the 80s, at the beginning of the 90s, when Spain was growing up, we did something just to put everything together. So we are not that bad. Probably this is the, due also the fact from the national programs, for example, the Ramon y Cajal, all these programs that tend to be evaluated nationally and not at the university level. So and while the other countries, it seems that all the other countries seem that is a little bit going up a little bit. But let's try to correlate this thing with other stuff, for example. For example, with corruption. And this is, uh, here we have the, the nepotism, let's say, the fraction of nepotism. And here, an, an index that is called the Corruption Perception Index, that is an index that is been estimated every year since the 95 from this international agency that is called Transparency International. And in principle, what it says is, it says how the citizen of a, a one country perceived that the, their country as corrupted or not. This is the, and the index is, uh, is reversed. So zero means very corrupted and 10, this is hard to read, but this is a 10, this is eight, and this is 10. 10 means they are not corrupted. And also what happens is that each country here appears more because we have estimates for every, every year from the 95 to 2013. So there are something like around 20 points for each, for each country. And the good guys are always good. Actually the correlation, it's really, really good. Because what happens is that if you have low kinship, low corruption. The things that messed up everything is the bad countries that actually behave exactly as they, uh, totally random. For example, there are two countries, Russia, because Russians do whatever they want. They actually, they spend the entire spectrum, let's say, and the yellow one is China also. So the, uh, there is a correlation, but the good correlation is from this part. This, in this part, you cannot say everything. Actually, the, if you evaluate the R is 0 0.73, it's not too much. Another thing that you can do, you can also calculate, for example, uh, with the academics, measures. The first one, uh, actually it took me something like, my co-authors uh, spent something like one month trying to explain in this kind of graphics. So I will try to explain it to you. <laughs> the idea is, the idea is these are just correlation, um, correlation graphics in which what you do is that you compare the signal that you have, so in this case, papers with uh, part of a family against the baseline, so all the other papers. So you are just uh, making the ratio. So if you have that the data falls out in the, in around one, means that there is no correlation, no difference between the two things. If the data go more than one, what happens is that probably there is a positive correlation, less than one, a negative correlation. That's the, that's the idea. And in this case, we are considering the number of authors. So how many authors are in a paper? And usually what happens is that uh, papers, let's say kinship papers, tend to have more authors than you expect at random. This is quite easy. If I have to push my son there just to, <laughs> to sign the paper, someone else should do the job. So mm -hmm. you, need, you need a random poor guy with no name doing the job and then your kid signing the paper. 
for the impact factor of the, of the journals where they were published, things are not clear. Because for example, what happens is that in Italy, it seems there is a strong negative correlation because usually papers tend to have a lower impact factor than you expect. But I don't know what happened in Eastern Germany. I don't know which kind of journals they have, but the things that they had, I don't know, but it seems that they are correlated with a higher impact factor on, on overage. But that's the, um, so it seems that the, the major countries, for example, India, uh, Italy, uh, USA, Spain, UK, Germany, Netherlands, it seems to be correlated with a lower impact factor on overage than you expect, respect as random. But the, um, another thing that I can show you, and this is, I promise this is the last, this is the last thing, is obviously as we marked uh, each author as part of Nova family, you can also analyze the co-authorship network. So in orange here, what we have is the, let's say uh, in orange we have nodes that are part of a family and in blue, normal, normal nodes. So this is the ego network. So the network considering uh, uh, the, the friends, I mean the first neighbors and their connections between them from a part of a node that is part of a family and this is no kin. As you can see that there are many more uh, connections and these are my favorite. This is an entire family. They are 10 and they work in the same department. I will not say the nationality, but it's okay. <laughs> and they are ten. actually everyone worked with this guy except this one, probably something like the nephew, is <laughs> the old nephew or something like this, the one who had been just kicked out of the family. But this is the, um, the entire picture. As you can see, they are also, the sides of the node is the degree that they have in the original network, not in this abstraction. So the guy is quite important, let's say. And if you analyze these networks, for example, you can see that the number of nodes that are part of the family actually are the 3% that we more or less uh, we counted before. And they overlap. But the most, important, the most interesting thing is about the clustering coefficient. Clustering coefficient is a measure of uh, how many triangles you are closing in the network. And usually for social network, this measure is quite high. For example, if I sign up with Maxi and Jose, it's highly probable that Maxi and Jose already signed a paper together or will sign it in the future. And what happens is that this 0 0.6 that you expect over one that is quite normal in this kind of networks, if you consider only king connections, actually it's way smaller. It's almost the half of what you see, uh, what you see normally. So what happens is that these kind of structures with one guy in the middle and people not collaborating within them are way more normal in this sense than this one when you have more connections. So let's say there are stars with the guy in the middle, members of the family, but between them, they do not collaborate too much. Another thing that you can see, you can see also what happens in, um, <coughs> for example, in terms of importance of the node. So two measures are the average degree and the, the between centrality. The between centrality is just a measure, a measure of how central a node is inside the network. So the highest the between the centrality, more central is the, is the guy. And what's happened is that you can see they are clearly separated. So what happened is that you can see that the, uh, usually people part of a family have a larger degree, as we say, because they tend to have more collaborators on overage than you expect. And also uh, tends to have a larger between the centrality. So also they have important places inside the network. You know, and this is, uh, this is more or less coherent also if you use other kinds of measures, for example, uh, K-core decomposition and other things. So what happens is at the end, we have this picture where what happens is that we have these guys that are plays important roles inside the network. Also, they are, uh, also they tend to create this star-like structure, let's say less democratic structures, just abusing a little bit the, the term. And the last thing we can see is also how they connect between them. Not only the fact that they are important guys, but also how they, how they connect. And the idea is that we are measure, not a, me um, a measure of assertivity, so of correlation between, in this case, the degrees that they have. And what happens is that if you consider this is the R Pearson coefficient, so it goes between one and minus one, 
And you can see that is, they are slightly correlated for the entire network, meaning that what happens is that if you have a node with a large degree, you tend to connect with people with a large degree. So uh, big guys tend to work together. This is more or less what happens. In the case, if you only consider parts of the family, this is even stronger. So if I'm a, let's say, bad guy, and I'm a big, I'm a big guy, I try to collaborate with bad guys. This is the important thing. But the most interesting thing is this one. Obviously, it's slightly negative. It's almost zero. But if you compare with the other one, this is how they mix between the two types, the good and bad guys, let's say. Actually, they tend not to mix, so mix at random. They try to avoid themselves. So if I'm a good guy, I know that the, the other one is a bad guy, I tend to not collaborate with him. That's more or less the, the thing. And OK, just let me summarize very briefly. This is more or less what we, what we found. A world is not such a bad place. Nepotism is quite low. And also what happens is that it's not, so, uh, it's not increasing, or at least it's almost constant. What happens is that obviously some countries need to work a little bit. And also, it seems that these kind of things are, corre are correlated with, the, with, for example, with corruption, lower impact factor, and other metrics. And most importantly, is, this is also for future scientists, let's say, that probably they tend to create these less democratic structures around them. So if you are a young scientist in the field, don't, enter the the, don't work with the professor that already has his son, his daughter, and his wife working there. Because probably you will not go anywhere. So, I guess I'll say this. That's all. Thank you so much for keeping awake. These are all the guys that work on this thing. These one, two, and three were friends from the university. This one was the guy who wrote the paper because he's English like the, like, like the queen, so he gives a, an important thing. And this guy, this is the guy, this is American, he's a guy that analyzed all the affiliation data because they were, they were a mess. So, Thank you so much for your attention. So we have uh, some time for questions. Okay, let me repeat. Uh, Giorgio Meloni, it's not my cousin. No, actually, the, in Spain, it's even better. Because what happens usually is that, obviously, for each country, we, for each country that we knew, we try to analyze the set separately. For example, for um, Russian countries that where women change the surname, the last letters of their surname, we just consider this thing. For Spain, it's even better. Because with this method, usually in most countries, what happens is that you have to, um, well, you only can follow father and son or daughter. Yeah, but in Spain, actually, what you can do, you can follow also the other side. Well, only two yeah, only two generations, but better than nothing. Mm -hmm. Another good thing is about France, because in France, what happens is that uh, women tend to take their husband name. So actually, you can on, not only reconstruct the fact that uh, actually they were married, all this thing, but also you can reconstruct when they change the, if they work in the same department, when they change the last name. If, before or after they, they get the position, let's say. They enter the department. <laughs> so for some country, it was easier. Uh, for example, for India, we have no idea. I mean, we put it there because one of the countries that publish most papers, one of the first uh, few, 25, but we have no idea. But for some countries, it was even easier than you expect. I think that, Margot. Yeah. I have some questions. Um, okay, the, the first one is closely related, but uh, uh, the surname as a, a figure of merit uh, is uh, already like catching all the women, yeah. more or less. In the yeah, it, it actually depends on the country. Because for yeah, example, yeah, in the yeah, United yeah. States, it, sometimes what happens is that the women take the name of the, uh, the surname of the husband. So yeah. for, yeah? Usually. Yeah. And also the good thing is that the uh, United States something like accounts for, I told you, more than 40% of the papers. So the vast majority of the, but in countries like uh, Italy or Spain, you only follow the father, let's say. They said in this case, uh, gender imbalance helped a lot. The fact that in some disciplines there are fewer women, fewer, let's say, girls than you expect, helped because you have more fathers than, uh, than mothers, let's say. Okay. Uh, then uh, another consideration is uh, 
let's say, not a scientific consideration, but uh, from a, a humanistic point of view, you are evaluating not the nepotism uh, strictly said of uh, mm, like giving a job in academia to a relative, but you are evaluating when uh, not only you do this, but you take it in your same group. Yeah, I mean, more in the same group that we work together, because what happens is that usually, um, I mean, it's true, this is just a proxy of what you have, but the, the thing is that uh, in this case, uh, usually what happens is nepotism is, is local. The fact that you usually try to hire your, your son in your department, and most of the times he works in your group because nobody wants to work <laughs> with them. So this is something that is local. Uh, one thing that happened a few years ago is that another law in Italy, actually they prohibited hiring people something like to the third or fourth degree of <laughs> Latinness, I don't know how to but, call but that. Indeed, from my humanistic perspective was uh, how can something like this be being statistically significant? significant? Because uh, I'm expecting that uh, a behavior like uh, hiring in your same local group, your yep. son or your relative, is, I mean, it's really rare, let's say. I'm expecting that it's something that it's a very big and clear scandal. So I'm expecting. Well, I, I, you saw, I mean, there are something like 10 guys working in the same department. <laughs> so it's not a huge but, uh, scandal, actually. But are you sure that they are, uh, they, they are in the same family or they just have the same surname? I mean, they work, in the, they work together. They are in the same department. Also, some, I mean, I, I went to the names for these 10 guys, not for all of them. And actually, uh, most of them, is something like this. The one is the, the grandfather, the biggest one, was something like a, a huge professor of medicine in, in an Italian university. And the other one, the first one that you can, <laughs> it's not the, the family that you think, it's another family. But the thing is that the, at least the first, the first connection was something like his sons, sons and daughters. Yeah. The other one you cannot say. But the thing is that uh, all this thing is, uh, we made this thing in this way uh, just to keep it, uh, let's say, let's try to subestimate what we have, but be sure that what we have is relevant. Because if you just stay, for example, level of department, level of uh, city, what happens is that there are lots of different things. So in some cases, we are just skipping some. We are only keeping the cases that are sort of like scandals. Yeah, Beca but uh, how can this be statistically significant? significant? In which sense? Obviously, if you have, what but happens uh, is that... But I'm expecting that uh, uh, focusing only on these uh, cases, uh, we, we cannot have uh, like uh, 2,000 cases in a country or something like this. I mean, because uh, how many, how actually, many if you count them, I mean, over oh, no. over five, over six million authors. These are only people who publish papers in uh, in health literature. We have something like uh, um, one hundred. It was something like almost two hundred thousand. So I mean, you can in one country, and this word we are talking about only the first ten countries mainly. Mm -hmm. So. Usually we have something like more than 10,000 cases per country. That you find this? Uh, this uh yeah, I mean, in, on average you have something like 20 uh, or something like this, because the, these numbers here, this is for the entire network, but the first uh, 10 countries account for something like 75% of the papers. So yeah, yeah. this number starts to be quite large in, in the countries that you can say something. For example, yeah, in the yeah, United yeah. States and the other things. Obviously, if you consider that it's concentrated, for example, for countries like uh, Italy or other cases, you start to have at least something like 20,000 or something like that. So it's obviously, it, obviously it, this is a huge proxy. I mean, one of the disclaimers I did at the beginning is that obviously we are talking something that is really hard to measure. And what you are doing, you are trying to just pick up only the most important cases. But if you compare, for example, the fact that we signed two or three papers together with the, the distribution of surnames that you have, it's highly probable that if we sign three papers together, our surname is not common. It's not, let's say, uh, Gomez or in Spain or Rossi in Italy. It's highly probable that we are, we are family. But as I told you, it's us. Ah, but you cut off the first 50. Yeah. OK, OK. So actually, the sign that you get at the end, the, it's just, it's only for the yeah, your distribution is almost, let's say, not flat, but almost flat. Okay. So it's not, it doesn't have an MVT. Okay. Uh, can, can you suggest some effective method to find 
Yeah, uh, I <laughs> don't, don't give the universities the possibility of, of higher people. Do at, the, the, at the, do at the central level, the highest level that you can. If you can at the European level, it's even better. Because it's clear that you let the university choose their own guys, they are choosing their, their guy. I mean, they're choosing people that is around them. Yeah, that's the reason. Also, the U.S., the things that families just split up after a after few years. So what's happening is that usually you have, they are better distributed. But if you have something like, something like working here, and they have decided we're going to hire, obviously they're going to hire between themselves. Between themselves. So they are not moving to. So if you do, for example, I think that the, the main difference between Spain and, uh, Spain and, uh, and Italy probably is this one. Italy doesn't have national programs like Juan de la Sierva, Ramon y Cajal, or this thing. Everything is done more or less locally. And locally, obviously, if I'm a huge professor of medicine in one university, probably I will not hire my, my son, but my friend, yes. That's, that's, that's the main thing. So this national program, for example, the programs from CSIC that more or less the, let's say, the committee is not chosen by the by the institute, for example, probably helps. Yeah. Like yeah, because a larger scale you can avoid this kind of trades. Because right now, what they are doing in Italy, because they prohibited hiring people, uh, your relatives in the same department. So what they did, they are exchanging. So this is really hard to, me to measure. They are exchanging people. So I'm a huge professor. I want to my son get hired. I cannot hire him. So the other university will hire him, and I, I will hire the son of the other professor. So we are just exchanging. But uh, as usual, Italy is another level. I mean, it's, in this kind of things, it's not comparable. But if you do this at the national level, so the highest level that you, that you can, so you pick uh, people of the committees at random, or at least uh, someone involved, but other people know. So you try to avoid this thing, but there is no, I mean, every time you have a rule, there is somebody just trying to pass by the rules. So. Okay. So if there is no more questions, let's thank Sandro again. Thank you.